I live? <laughs> I'm live. It didn't show up the live button. <laughs> so, I was trying to mess with the little lights. The live button did show. Are we live? I hope we're live. Please tell me that we're live. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so I have a new setup. If you haven't noticed, happy new year to everybody. Sorry for the delay. I wanted to put this behind me, but I didn't know if it would show up in the background. So we have some interesting topics coming in today. So first we're going to be talking about what's going on with the housing inventory. Then we're going to be talking about a girl whose driveway got stolen. Of all things, she has her house on the market. Our driveway got stolen. And we're going to be talking about more predictions that come in from the, you know, the big wigs. If you missed my last video uh, at the end of the year, I did like a roundup of what was going on in, in the, uh, in the um, prediction. And so I was comparing it to the predictions that they had said at the end of 2023 and what actually happened. I do that every single year. So I'll probably do it again this year because it's always interesting because, you know, they always have these big predictions and then they kind of have to walk them back throughout the year. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, we hello, Jeremy Knight. Welcome from Austin, Texas. We need to have you on here in, in a bit. We haven't had you in here for a hot minute. Hot minute. Um, we should be having a guest today. Hopefully, he'll be able to jump in and jump on. I gave him a link, so hopefully he'll make it. But if not, we could always have fun on our own. I hope you guys are enjoying the new year, 2024, shaping up to be another one of those years that is a full of unprecedented events, you know, like, I, I don't know about you. And I've been saying this for the last two years. I'm really tired of unprecedented events. I'm ready for like the most boring year ever where like everything's great. The weather's great. Nobody has like, there's no major tragedy that hits the world. That, that would be really nice. I'm asking for a lot though. I know that <laughs> I'm asking for a big, a lot, a lot, a lot. So just in the chat, if you could just tell me where you're coming in from, I could see a few of you, you already have your, your names in your, uh, in your screen name living in Omaha. I, I already know where you're coming in from. You're coming in from Omaha. Do you know that there's one state I've never been to Omaha? We got Maryland in here. We got, um, we got, is it Orlando? No, she was saying hello. To oh, our guest is on his way. He's setting up his uh, his mic right now. <laughs> oh, Sedona, Arizona. That's a beautiful area out there. My parents went out there RVing. So uh, we got New York City. We, New York City. We got North Carolina. We got Michigan. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I see some old faces and some new faces. It's great to see all of you. What do you guys think of the new setup? What do you think? Does it look good? <laughs> All right. Now, enough of the wishy-washy, mishy-washy. Nobody wants to talk about this. Eddie, if you could, uh, I know we said we we're going to do the USA story first, but let's go ahead and talk about the interest story, which is the one where the girl's, her her uh, driveway got stolen. Super interesting. So apparently, uh, Eddie's going to pull up that story and put it up on the screen. Uh, this girl decides to put her house up on the market. And as soon as she put the, her house up the market, anybody that knows it's selling a house, you start getting calls from all sorts of vendors, people that are looking to, uh, you know, spruce up your house or add some landscaping or, you know, fix some repairs before you put your house on the market, everything under the sun. When you, as soon as your house goes up on the market, trust me, there's going to be people calling you. Um, the other thing that happens whenever you put your house on the market, scams start. And one of the biggest scams other than this one is, uh, you know, people will steal the listing, you know, steal the pictures from the listing and put it on Craigslist and make it seem like it's a, a real deal of a century for renters. Renters go ahead and wire these people the money. Of course, there is no house for, to rent. That is, that's a common scam that's been going on. I don't even know since I've been in real estate ever since Zillow and, and uh, Craigslist was a thing. But this lady right here didn't understand, like, uh, this was new to me. I never had heard this before. So she had been getting all these phone calls from people that were saying, oh, we got a call that your husband said that you needed a quote for a new driveway. She said, I'm not married. And I didn't ask for a quote. And then her son uh, was home from sick from school one day. Sure enough, uh, there was people in the driveway measuring it. And the little boy was scared and she was like, oh, don't answer the door. You know, I'll take care of it. Then the next day, somebody showed up to her house, said that they were there to measure the driveway to, you know, go ahead and uh, replace it. She said, I did not ask for this. Do not do this. And at that point, she go, went ahead and got the police involved and said, hey, 
there are people keep showing up to my house that want to replace my driveway. I have not requested this quote. I don't want it. So sure enough, the police got a hold of that phone number. They said, oh, it should be fine. Don't worry about it. She goes to work that day. She comes home and the whole driveway has been stripped. The neighbors saw that her driveway was getting stripped, but didn't think to like literally, you know, call or look to see who was doing it. And nobody has taken claim of it. Um, somehow it's like, a it's, it has to do with like a, uh, like a contractor is telling a subcontractor, look, I don't have the money to pay you, but you know, I'll give you some work and then these people will pay you. And then, you know, it's cheap work. So, you know, it will all work out. And so then like, the thing is, is that she doesn't have a driveway and she has no way of having the money to pay for it. Lady has no driveway. Total insanity, total insanity. So um, I believe this was in Orlando. Oh, now they put that darn thing behind a paywall. <laughs> Go figure. Go figure. Um, yeah, but they have this all over uh, the internet. You can watch it. This Fox News has it. Um, uh, Yahoo News has it. Yeah, she's been all over the place. She actually did an interview on Fox News as well. I feel bad for her. I mean, I can't even imagine coming home from work and my whole driveway being this thing. And nobody, like, there's no one there like there's no one to call there's no one to correct the problem you know like if you have work done on your house and it was done on the wrong house usually there's somebody to clean up i've had i've had this happen before where uh contractors went to a house to replace a uh a roof and they started and then the people came home and they were like what are you doing and they're like oh we're here to replace the roof and they're like we didn't ask for it they they had transposed the 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 numbers of the address so they had to replace they had to replace a section of that roof <laughs> and do the other house. <laughs> so I've seen that happen, but um, yeah, I, the, 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 the scam was not clear on why her, uh, her driveway had been stolen. Like they, it wasn't quite clear in the article. So it was, unbelievable to me, you know, and I don't know if a homeowner's insurance would cover it because it is technically theft, right? But it's not theft on the, on the actual structure of the home because it's not considered a attached component. I guess it would depend on your state. Like uh, here in Louisiana, driveways aren't considered a, an attached component, but uh, other parts of your structure of the home are considered uh, you know, it depends on your state. Some states will consider driveway attached component. So uh, I, I don't know. It's a real hot mess. I just hope somebody like, you know, some good Samaritan steps up and says, Hey, I'll replace your, uh, your driveway. Cause you know, she's trying to sell it. The whole, the whole thing is that she's trying to sell her house. How is she going to sell her house with a no driveway? That <laughs> Everybody put your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Happy airs in the house. Yeah. yeah. They see how, like, we talked like an hour beforehand. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm, if I'm running a little late, she'll text or call me. Nope. You let people just, if they're late, they're late. <laughs> not even, not a curfew, hey, man, we're about to start or something. I just figure you are grown up enough, you know. Grown you up? What's that? Me, <laughs> if you make it, if you make it, if you can't, you can't, you know, I, I, I know how to talk to myself for a long time. <laughs> I've been doing it my whole life. I'm my own best friend. So <laughs> if I have to say or talk to myself, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> I hate to be that guy that's late and then just has a Starbucks. Oh, it's up guys. What's going on? I'm sorry. I'm late. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> if you, if you were drinking, if you had to go get Starbucks, I wouldn't do uh, that. I was, I, we're cleaning up right now. So that's why. Sorry about that. Uh, you're, you're still, you're still on my special buddy list. You're fine. <laughs> well, what kind of special? Yeah. You know, special buddy list. You know, <laughs> there's some people that are not on my special buddy list. People that have used my image on thumbnails and stuff that, that, and said bad things about me. They're, they're not on my special buddy list. <laughs> That's funny. Cause I had an, an interesting experience where somebody was on my chat saying that that person may have been, may have been saying stuff about me. And then they couldn't find anything. And then they had to find something like in a Discord server or something like that. But I was like, oh, I don't know. It's like you you, 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 you choose not to, you know, yeah, whatever. I'd rather drop it. Yeah. Let's not start any drama this year. Yeah. Let's like, why give that oxygen? Yuck. Right. 
yuck. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Anyways, so, um, Eddie, about that USA Today uh, article. So USA Today comes out with an article about their predictions for 2024. Kind of the same old, same old, a lot of stagnant market stuff. You know, we could see, you know, um, you know, like uh, significant uh, activity in some markets while other markets drop, blah, blah, blah. But the thing that I found really interesting is this one paragraph. Eddie, if you could scroll on down past that that image of the girl in the in the blazer. Uh, da, da. Here we go. Here we go. So up, 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 up. There we go. Add it all highlight. It says, despite high households will have more options in 2024. So they're saying that there's going to be increased construction in 2024. Uh, will be a small uptick in small family home construction in the completion of a large number of multifamily units that are under construction. The mass, vast, the vast majority of these are designated to be rental homes. That to me, and this is my whole thing that I've been saying for years now. Jeremy Knight can even tell you, I, he was on my live stream when I said this. The The whole deal, I think, in the future is everything that's being built now is not meant for sale for the typical average person trying to buy a house. I think it's all designed for rental units. And so they're saying the supply will be allevi alleviated because of all this new construction in multifamily homes that will be for rent, not to purchase. Ugh. And so Crow Homestead, who lives in the UK, says it's not just the US. Housing shortages in development countries are widespread issue for a complex mix of reasons. I think it's because the wealthy has designed it that way. <laughs> but that's my <laughs> we got a top one percent in every every uh, aspect of every area of the world. So what do you think about my theory, Javier? So you're just to just to be clear, your theory is that the upper echelon designed a system of every single thing every single or most single family households are designed to be turned into rentals not home homes my 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 and so like what's a quick one two liner of your theory that that the supply of home shortage it will not be alleviated because they've designed it where home construction has become so incredibly difficult to do that there will be more homes for investors to buy as rental units instead of being sold to the average American trying to buy their home next home. Well, but that's, it's, it's interesting because right now um, we're seeing less investors opt into the rental market because rentals are actually declining in prices like pretty severely. Like there's, I'm helping a couple out. They were looking for a rental that would have been easily $3,000 like a year ago. They're mm -hmm. looking like in the 19 to 2200 range. So I'm not sure if that's the case. I mean, I think that's, that's definitely, um, it's, it's terrifying to think of the amount of uh, capital that the investors really gained over the last three years. And it's really crappy because all those homes should have gone to families and people wanting to own, not necessarily rentals, mm -hmm. but I'm curious to see this year as interest rates drop and homeowners start kind of hopefully challenging and starting into getting introduced again, if they're going to come back, because what's, what's concerning to me is it, I do think there's going to be a slight price. There's going to be price drops this year. I'm concerned that if it's a severe price drop, we're going to get those companies introduced again into the fold. And I think people don't realize that like whenever there is cheap real estate, those companies come in and take really a lot more of the market share of these family properties. So I think we need to re reach a happy, I know I'm kind of going off topic from your questions, but I think we need mm -hmm. to reach a, a point where housing, it, it hurts a little bit to get, but it's not this crazy. But because if it's too, un if it's too affordable, then we're, we're allowing them to come in and just increase prices again. Because I do think one of the main reasons why we're here in this mess in the first place is all the massive cash offers that were introduced over the last two, three years that people had to be forced to compete with, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure if that's, if that's the, how it's designed to be. I know that they definitely have taken advantage of, this, of, the, of the system, though, that I'm sure already favors them. My whole thing is that like, I'm sure that like in some areas, some investors have pulled out, but where are they going to like uh, Jeff true. Bezos, 
you know, may have pulled out of Arizona and Austin, Texas of buying a bunch of properties because that's what he was doing before the pandemic around the Amazon building. They were buying up Amazon, a subsidiary of Amazon was building up, buying up single family homes around there, uh, around that uh, area. Um now, like, so they, now they're not buying there, but they're buying in Seattle. So are they just taking their money from one market and pulling it into another market? And then when interest rates are low, that makes cheap money for investors too, right? Even the smaller investors that maybe they're not buying 100 homes, but they're buying 20 homes. That's cheap money, right? So lower interest rates help investment companies too. Even though they may not buy, be buying cash, they some of them put it into mortgages, you know? Yep, yep. So, I mean, does that make it even more more easy, more for easy for them to be able to buy up more housing? Is it going to cause more of a problem, especially especially at the lower end of of housing, like homes that are under two hundred thousand dollars? You you feel like you won a lottery if you find one of those, you know. And then, um, I, I don't know about your area, but in a lot of areas, it's it's like that, you know, and investors love that, you know, a house under 200,000, even if it's a piece of junk, they're like, we can fix it up because they've got enough, you know, people under their belt to, you know, fix those houses up and get them up for rent. Um, what, what, do, what do you think is the line of like, because we because there's those that think that there has to be some capitalism involved, right? Like you have to have some competition in the in the real estate space where you know buyers get into a nice house and there's bidding so the seller makes more money or should it be to the point where we're back to down payment assistance programs where buyers are being gifted a lot of money from the government or entities to buy houses again like where what is the what is the line you think that how much intervention we need to be receiving to the point where we're back to health to a healthy market um i think there needs to be because this is this entity of investment purchasing is bigger than it's ever been in history. So I think there needs to be a cap on how much investment purchases can happen in one specific area. So in each neighborhood, not more than 10% of homes can go to investment companies. So that way they don't dictate the price of what real estate is in that specific area. Because mm -hmm. you know, as well as I do, if, if investment firms own, let's just say 30 or 40% of a neighborhood, they can dictate the price. Even if they own 20% and they tanked all, like they sold all their houses at one time, time, right? And they made it for a huge discount, $120,000 less than what the houses were selling for, but they just wanted to get it off their books. That is going to affect all the houses that are in that neighborhood. So I think that there should be some kind of cap in each neighborhood that doesn't allow for X amount of investment uh, purchasing. That's just my idea. That's such a it. great point. No, no, it's it's really a great point because it it reminds me of new build communities. Uh, I think people realize how how fixed the prices are because if they're building a hundred houses, the first twenty houses they're going to kind of take a gamble at, right? Well, now they control the prices of the of those those houses that are being built next, and they can kind of slowly raise the value artificially by continuing to raise the price, raise the price, and by the people like you should never buy a, a house towards the end of a builder like of that community because that house you're buying, that model has sold already at least 40 times. Let's say they built 40, 100 houses. I don't know, 100 houses. They've it's already sold 40 times and they've really stretched that value up to the point where it's they're selling it for 450 now. But we don't really know what the true value of that is because it's just based off comps of their building, right? So right. You're, you just reminded me of like builders and how they set up the system and people who are at the very end get to kind of jump and see because there's going to be a price decrease, of course, because once... They're using their own comps, but then once they open it up to everywhere, once it's being done, then th th there's a big drop. So, um, but yeah, in 100, percent there should be some kind of adjustment or something along those lines. I just found this article. I sent it to Eddie, but that's what you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's buying houses in Miami now. Yeah, he was buying them in Seattle too. He's buying them in Seattle too. You know, and like, like, and this is the whole thing. He is probably one of the most powerful men on the planet. Because even Trump, yeah, more powerful than our government, even, huh? Uh, yeah, because I mean, he he's in our government. Are you kidding me? I mean, like, really? He's bought and sold many no politicians a million times over. He whatever he wants, he can make happen. He's pretty much untouchable, uh, in my opinion. And so we're gonna allow. Like, can you imagine making your payment to and like, oh, is Amazon Prime today? I, I get half off my <laughs> rent this month. You know. Um, According to Bloomberg, he's attempting to buy up several neighborhood properties. 
Oh, he did this last year in near near his home in Seattle with extra houses and the staff. Good Lord. He's just, I don't think there's a really, like, you can't look at a billionaire and say, you're a good person. <laughs> like, I, I don't think people become billionaires beca just because they're good people. And it, I just, that's. Yeah, that's what my, my wife says all the time. There's no ethical billionaires. If, if they made it that far, it's on people's backs. Um, they squashed yeah. somebody along the way. You know, they did some pretty crazy stuff. That's why we're not billionaires. Huh? That's because we choose not to do that, right? I don't need to be a billionaire to be happy. That's, that's, I think it's sad that they feel like they have to be, do that. They have to, like, in order to feel accepted in the world, they have to just keep making more money. You know, I, did, I think it's gross. I think, ugh. Anyway, that's why the Wall Street says the worst. Yep. Uh, as all the uh, all the big investors buying up ho uh, housing properties when they become more and more affordable reminds me of Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life. I love yes. that movie. Yeah, but that's true though. You know, remember, you know, like the the banker I, was just. I know, I know. I, I've watched I've watched it three times every Christmas. I just watched it last week. I, I'm very aware. Um, you cry at the end. I do. Oh man. <laughs> It's so true, uh, though. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting how every year I watch it, Mr. Potter becomes a different entity, right? So, um, to me, I, I don't think we talk about this a lot. And I'm going to go on my on my my milk crate here, but I, you know, a big issue that I see in the real estate industry is yes, of course, the giant corporations and whatnot. But I really do not like wholesalers. Like I genuinely despise wholesalers because I they hate, cut their profits off at the I, I hate that they are basically make their living off finding uh people who are in a tough situation yep. who could probably sell their house for a lot more just with a yep. little uh you know intervention and I mean is it necessary sometimes yes but they'll find it they'll okay they'll buy it and then they'll find a fixed and flipper who doesn't know what they're doing to buy it for thirty forty thousand dollars more than they bought it for and now the fix and flipper has 40k off their budget they need to worry about and then who ends up paying the price buyers i really despise a whole the fix and flip the old hgtv like monster created a lot of like just madness or people wanting to dip in and become investors and become fixed and flippers. And it really idolizes this idea that a house is an investment when really it's a bunch of, it really shouldn't be viewed as an investment. Or if it was an investment, it's an investment that was meant for people, everyday people and hardworking Americans, not corporations or people wanting to take advantage of that. Fix and flippers and then created wholesalers and they're all a bunch of scum. And I I, I, I appreciate a fix and flipper that's like genuine, like a person who just bought one house and they lived in it for three, five years. They flipped it and then they, okay, now I got to move because I have three kids or whatever. But the people that do it as a business, I genuinely despise. And I, I, I've i gotten a lot of people messaging me that I'm wrong and I'm all this other. I, I don't care. I genuinely do not like them. If anybody doesn't know what a wholesaler is, it's somebody that basically sees somebody that has a distressed property or knows that they're in a situation where they they need help. So they offer to buy that, take that property off of their hands, um, knowing that at the point where it's fixed up, we'll just say at the fixed up point, it's worth two hundred and fifty thousand, and they're and they know it's going to take about fifty thousand dollars to fix it up to that point. So they'll offer them. Uh, 150,000 to get it off their hands so they don't have to worry about it. And then some negotiation goes back and forth. So at that point, they become the middleman. So now they've paid that person, you know, their money. They've moved out there. They feel satisfied. And sometimes they're, they don't even pay them. Sometimes they get it sold during escrow. So they never fork yeah. the money. <laughs> yep. Yep. So the, yeah. So then it, you know, they become the middleman. Yeah. So then they find an investor that will buy it knowing that the, what the spread is and how much it's going to take them to fix it up. Then the flippers. Yeah. So yeah, I, there is a, uh, I don't, it became a real big thing probably about six years ago. Everybody, every, everybody I knew would be, was a wholesaler. And I'm like, how can you be a wholesaler and a real estate agent at the same time? That there, there seemed to be an ethical loss there. And um, some areas won't allow you to do both. So, uh, but somebody had put up something. I think it was, her name was Susan that put up something that said that in order a foreclosure can't go to uh, investors. That yeah, was should, an interesting yeah. thing. Yeah, it. She, this, she said it should be a law that. I think it was, her name was Susan, and she said that uh, uh, investors shouldn't be allowed to buy. 
They should be a totally different market. So, you know, back in the day, like into this day, whenever banks have like a, a boatload of investment properties or a boatload of uh, foreclosures, they'll say to an investment company saying, hey, look, we have all these foreclosures. We're not going to do crap with them. You can go ahead and do what you want. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad, but it's up to you to fix them. So they buy them on the cheap. And then they go in and decide if they're going to turn them into, uh, you know, rental properties or not, or, they, you know, or they take them and sell them to the next like wholesaler or flipper or something um, just to get them off their books. The banks do that. They've done that. They they found the cash cow after the last housing crash because the banks got stuck with all those properties that were foreclosed on because of crummy loans that they created. And then the investment companies, they were like, hey, you did us wrong <laughs> with these stupid packages. You're going to take these properties. And so then they decided, well, what are we going to do with these properties? We're going to rent them out. That's what we're going to do. So they took a they took a lemon and made some lemonade out of it. But in the in turn, because if they made so much money from it, they were like, huh, yeah, you know what? We created a monster. We created a monster. They found out another way to make money. You're you know, so good look, at looking the at the lens, Christina. You're so good to look at the. I know you're not looking at me. You're just uh -huh. talking to that lens. I I know that you're so I'm, good at doing that. Oh, thank she, you. She's not looking at you guys. <laughs> just kidding. I'm looking right at you, dude. <laughs> she's looking right at us, guys. She's looking at our souls. <laughs> I'm looking straight into your soul. I know. Right? Well, like I, I I honestly think I don't know why I do that. <laughs> oh, you're so good at it. No, it's just it, it's great. That means that means you're you're talking to them directly. But I, when I'm at a live stream with you, though, I like, I look, I like, I do this. I should probably do this. So, so it looks like I'm talking to you. Hey, what's up, Christina? How are you? <laughs> Over here. Can, can you give me a high five? <laughs> no, no. Like, look at the screen. Oh, I think I have to do it this way. Yeah. Oh, I got to yeah, do backwards of what we're, it is. We're breaking. Is the, uh, all right. We're, <laughs> I think people can see that we're not in the same room now. Yeah. I think they do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got a new setup now. I like it. You're like, like a, you're a streamer now. Are you gonna Twitch stream? Twitch stream? No, I'm not a streamer. I don't Twitch stream. Yep. <laughs> if y'all have should. any questions about uh, investment properties, wholesalers, even manufactured homes, I can answer those questions. Any kind of real estate questions you have, just put the word question first, and then the question that you actually have. So it's easy for Eddie, the producer in the background, to see what it is, and uh, and, and then he can put it up on the screen. Are you still calling says, Sorry, What's ahead. that? No, never mind. You can go ahead. Uh, so Marcus Smith says Bill Gates is the largest landowner in the United States. Do you know uh, he may be the largest one, but do you know who's right behind him? You want to know the largest landowner in the United States is the Emerson family, which owns tw uh, a boatload of land, <laughs> acres of land, uh, what two point three million acres of land. Emer uh, Red Emerson, the patriarch of the family founded by Sierra Pacific Industries in California, are the one of the largest, la uh, largest producers of lumber in the country and operate sawmills. The second list on the list is John Malone with 2.2 million acres of land. And the bil this billionaire businessman, philanthropist, philanthropist, yeah, billionaires and our philanthropists, whatever, was the CEO of uh, telecommunication companies for 24 years and is now the chairman of the Liberty Media, which is ownership stakes of Formula One, Sirius XM, and Atlanta Braves baseball team. Malone's land, his commitment is, uh, is in conservation. Do you want to know who else owns a boatload boatload of land the it pioneer, says here christina pioneer. smallhorn llc what it's, i don't have it a... says that you own a bunch of land here i just found our website <laughs> yeah 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 that's I, I get your game you're, you're pretending to be this people <laughs> uh, youtuber for the people but you're just buying up properties left and right no yeah <laughs> Don't so start rumors, dude. That's not true. <laughs> Don't listen to him. He's full of garbage. But um, I do have an LLC. That's funny that you say that. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I, I own a couple it says you own uh, 500 properties in, oh, there's Wally. No, so uh, the pioneer woman, she, her and her husband own like tons of land in Oklahoma. Like, I think they probably own half the state. <laughs> pioneer woman? Yeah, the pioneer woman, that, that woman that cooks, you know? You ever seen her? She's like, she has all these recipes that are like super easy to, to make. My kids used to watch her. Pioneer woman. Yeah. Uh, I forget. Something Ray. I forget what her name is. 
Lawnmower, if you have, Lawnmower says, if you have any real estate questions, please type the word question first so the moderator can add it to the stream. Thank you, Lawnmower. Yeah. Is that yeah. what it is? Lawnmower? Yes. I thought it. it was, I thought it was like law. Oh, I guess it does make sense. <laughs> yeah, it's Lawnmower. He's my, he's my commonologist. He always has the best commentary in the chat. If you guys are ever bored with what we're talking, just look at the comments that Lawnmower makes. He's always, he's always on. He's, Ray, Ray Drummond. That's her name. Thank you. Ray Drummond. <laughs> Muddy Sneaker 77 says, question. Did you hear Mexico is changing the rules for non-citizens to buy property? Need to have at least $8,000 monthly income and, and nearly $100,000 in the bank. So in order for a, like an, uh, uh, somebody out, outside of the country of Mexico, you have to have that much. That makes sense. Um, yeah, there's a lot of um, people here, especially here in the Southwest, where they think they're 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 not they don't feel successful so they go and use their money and buy a properties in Mexico and mm -hmm. they'll go buy the properties in in Rocky Point and all the touristy areas and so they can make their fancy facebook pictures about how great their life is but they're going and bringing in all this money buying a property that should be going to locals so um and I'm glad that they're there's more enforcement about that because I mean whatever if that's the route you want to go that's the route you want to go but I imagine if I was a local in Rocky Point or whatever city and having all these people from from other country buying houses that can be more Airbnbs or investments, I would make me upset. So I don't know. I don't know too much Good about it, but I don't know, I don't well, know too much like, about it, but I don't like those kind of people. Well, if you think about it, some areas like in Colorado, in Montana, where they were considered like resort communities, there is nothing affordable for the people that actually live there year round to live in. Like now it's gotten to the point where like they've created basically like uh, little apartment houses where everybody rents a room just so they can afford to find a place to live. Like unless you have a family piece of property, you're not going to find a house to buy on your own. And you know, the people that just work the regular jobs, you know, like, delivering mail and you know as a waitress or even even have a small like little business in the area there isn't enough money for them to be made because these multi-billionaires have have come in and bought out everything and some of the solutions that they've come up with were like uh well what we can do is we can allow them to bring in a tiny home during the tour season and then they have to remove it afterwards because we don't want a bunch of tiny homes like they're and anything that's to solve the affordability crisis there in the area like creating affordable housing even affordable apartment buildings the billionaires or millionaires that live in the area are like oh no that will bring my property value down absolutely not but they want those same they want the same people that cheap labor to go ahead and serve them at their country clubs and stuff like that it's been a real problem a uh, real big issue in in a lot of the resort towns oh man um i'm gonna go tinkle really quick uh, have so a good I'll, time mention my I'll name you'll ready. get a good seat <laughs> what in the toilet seat <laughs> yeah mention my name you'll get a good seat <laughs> it'll be super quick i'll be right back <laughs> Oprah owns half of Montana, you know, and then like she owns a good chunk of Hawaii too, from what I, I read during the wildfires, apparently. Meet the 10 largest landowners in Montana in 2024. By the way, my aunt lives out there and so does my cousin. Let's see who they are. Let's see who the top 10 are. Eddie's scrolling down. John Hildebrand, he owns 118,000 acres. Let's see who else. Who else is on this? Side? Ted Turner. That isn't surprising. Former CNN owner, Ted Turner. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They own a lot of the United States, believe it or not. They are uh, big landowners, not just in Montana. Let's see. Uh, North Point, Great North Point Properties. Who's that? Ooh, we got to look who up that is. The Coffee Family. North Point, it was founded in 1992, is a coal-related assets of the Burlington Railroad. It's a privately held by Rhett and Charlotte Parker. The Montana properties are shared by natural resources and contribute to 14% of the NRP's reserves in 2001, according to the National Mining Association. Okay, the coffee, the coffee family. Let's see how much the coffee family owns. Let's see, coffees. Oh, they own 212 
212,000 acres. Coffees. Coffee. <laughs> Robert er Earl Holdings. I'm sure that's some kind of investment firm. They own 213,000. Let's see. Stan Kronike. I have no idea who this is. He, uh, he was married. Oh, married to the Walmart heiress. <laughs> well, now I know who he is. <laughs> also the owner of the Denver Nuggets. Okay. Good on him. The Galt family owns 248,000. Wow. Let's see what they do. Uh, they're, uh, the Wellington Reckon was Montana's largest private uh, landowner with over a million. But then they, they peaked out. Wellington was married to Louis Reckon, who inherited an estate in the Wellington died in 1966. A year later, American Reckon married Jack Galt, notable ranch manager. This property was passed down to the Galt family. All right. Ferris and Ferris and Dan Wilkes, they own 358,000 acres. Is this like, is this where uh, uh, Little House on the Prairie was done? I don't, I have no idea. All right, so we got so Southern Pine Plantations, and they own 630,000 630, acres. Wow. 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 Christina says, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I, you know what's so crazy when I hear something super crazy? Uh, Massachusetts now has a surplus of a billion dollars. Do you know how they did it? This is going to, I mean, this is going to be mind blowing to all of you. I mean, I know this is going to sound so crazy. Like, wow, they taxed the wealthy. <laughs> they taxed the rich. And you know what? They have a surplus of a billion dollars. <laughs> Who knew that if you tax the people that have the money, you'll get more money. Mind blown. I know. <laughs> so. Sears should uh, resurrect itself, create some um, competition, improve access to housing, and reintroduce the Sears home-built kits. I concur. If, if Sears does nothing else, if they created the Sears-built home kit once again, I think it would, could work. And then you could actually have like, uh, like you could have like little, um, pop-ups of uh contractors that work for sears and then they could you know, like you could hire the sears contractors right so you'd have the sears pop-up house like you, that you could put together yourself if you get into trouble you could contact the sears pop-up uh store and say hey look i'm really having trouble with this this plumbing and then they could send out their sears certified contractors to help you with that issue with their specific homes that would be absolutely genius absolutely genius the thing that most people don't understand about those those sears houses they were super cool well built they're still standing to this day but you would have to be on a line where the railroad road was because as you can imagine i mean that that stuff was heavy it was really heavy and so you had to not only you know you had to pick up all those pieces at the train station, <laughs> the pallets and pallets and pallets of pieces for your house. I mean, and it came all the way down to the little tiny screws. God forbid you lost anything on the way uh, to your, to your, the location, you know, like how are you going to find that? I mean, but they had extreme detail. There were well-crafted homes that you could put together yourself. I, I concur. I think that is a fantastic idea. I'm a big proponent of, modular homes because they are built to the same standards if not better standards than the traditional home built houses and they always meet or exceed the code that's in your specific area the problem with all builders having right now with building supply is that there's a ton of red tape more than there's ever been to build a house the the hoops that a developer has to go through in order to have a house built is crazy and th that is the number one reason why we don't have a bunch of smaller homes being built because the cost upfront for a a builder or a uh developer to develop that land ahead of time in order for them to make their costs that they that they have sheeted out you know re you know re sheeted out it has to meet like a certain number so they actually have they have no choice they have to make a bigger house to make the spread and so 
they have if they eliminated a lot of that red tape and they made it easier for developers to be able to build a more affordable houses, not only that gave them tax incentives to do it, we wouldn't be in this issue. And then the modular home building has been around for centuries. I mean, it's been around since after World War II and before that, but uh, before even before that. So it can be done again. And all they would have to do is they would go in a line and pour all the concrete slabs together. Then they could just throw those houses right on top of each other. They'd done it before. They could do it again. It's just the red tape now is impossible. Like they make, they've made it so that you couldn't make it possible for people today. And do I, my conspiracy hat thinks that this is correct? Yes. I think the, the my conspiracy theory says, yes, that these uh, upper, upper Chalant have made it, designed it this way. And yes, I know that sounds super crazy. I know it sounds tinfoily, but I, I genuinely believe that's what they want from us. Work until the day we die. Owe them everything. So when we die, there's nothing left to give to our next generations. They want us, they want to bury us in all of it. Ugh. Anyways, let's move on. <laughs> Oh look, you got a you got a ball cap. I want on. to I want to address the rumors. I did not poop. Oh good. Good for you. Did you wash your hands though? I will not I will I will I uh, plead the fifth. I'm just kidding. I wash my hands. Okay, good go. Good good. What were you talking about? I mean, you were passionate. Yeah, I was just I was talking about the red tape and why we don't see a lot of smaller homes being built. Let me ask you this. If you're you're feeling you like don't you don't get want to ask a question. The person or the screen had the question. I got to answer it. You get to ask okay. your question after this question. Yes. <laughs> All right. Does the U.S. health and safety, is it like in the U.K.? I see a lot of naughty accidents on American construction sites. Naughty I don't know accidents. What, I don't <laughs> Naughty here means something else. <laughs> You're a naughty boy. No. <laughs> Christina shows up and spanks people yeah. around. <laughs> You're naughty, naughty construction worker. <laughs> um, I I don't know. It depends on the state. Some states have really strict regulations when it comes to building houses, and there's people that drive around and make sure that they're following all the safety rules. And we have OSHA in place, and then other areas are like, yeah, someone will come around eventually. You know, I think it just depends on the on the state. Uh, every state in the United States kind of runs like its own individual country. Um, we all have our own little little laws that are different. That's why we have state laws and federal laws. But, you know, when it comes to home construction, it's always a little a little different, a little different in each state. So I, I don't know how to answer that correctly. All right. Now, what's your question, Javier? Let, let, <laughs> let's have it. If you if you're do you drink coffee? No. Why do you collect mugs if you don't drink coffee? I drink hot tea. I what kind of tea? Coffee. Um, it's called PG Tips. That's the brand, PG Tips. Okay, never mind. I was gonna ask, what's your favorite coffee place? Yeah, I don't. Apparently I don't drink nowhere. Coffee. How about what do you like to eat? Like pastries? I make my own bread. Oh my god! What do you? I, I, what don't, do you... I, I don't go out. The only thing I'll go out for food for is sushi, because I can't make that at home. Sushi in Louisiana? Yeah. Well, you're not. It's, it exists. Well, there you go. We have a sea, we're a seafood capital, man. We got tons that's of That's true. Seafood. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. We, we got some seafood. There's some good sushi out here. Brian Jesus. I follow Brian the foreclosure G. sites and get listings. How do we find out about pre-foreclosures? I would like to get a deal and help someone if out if I can. So uh, if you go on like... It, not that it's my favorite website, but they have the best for uh, pre foreclosures. You can go to foreclosure.com and you can check those out. I have a actually an affiliate link there if you decide to to use that website because they show you all the pre foreclosures and foreclosures that are on the market that you may not see on Zillow. But you can also look on Zillow. And Eddie and I actually almost bought our ha a house that way. We we saw a house that was in pre foreclosure, and how we did it was. <laughs> We saw that we went on the on the uh, tax assessor's website. We did see that they were behind on taxes and they were behind on their mortgage. So we sent them a letter and said, hey, look, you know, we see that you're in this desperate state. We have the cash right now to purchase your home. We plan on living there. We want to move into that neighborhood because it'd be really great for our family. Sure enough, you know, like there was, <laughs> they were said, no, no, we, we're fine. We don't need to sell. We're, we're in good shape. 
And then we ended up started building this house and sure enough, their house was foreclosed on. I'm like, I could have helped you. I really wanted that house. <laughs> wanted that house so bad. Oh, and I already had it all planned out in my head. I had already moved in in my brain and they didn't want to sell it to us. Rookie's mistake. <laughs> I know. Never I get know. emotionally attached. I know. I know. I was willing to help them though. They didn't want my help. Cassandra says, uh, Cassandra Marie says, question, what do you, you of, what do you of old hotels being turned? Oh, what do you probably, what do you think of old hotels turning into low income apartments? This is happening here in North Carolina and Durham and Raleigh. Um, if you have the building and it's accessible and they can actually turn it into a reasonable living area, I don't have a problem with that. I I've made I've, people on this show have heard me say this a thousand times, and I think it would be the most genius thing ever. So we have abandoned malls all over the United States. This is my this is my big dream, right? And so we have also have a growing number of boomers that are hitting the age where they need extra help in healthcare, right? So we take those abandoned malls, and you know, remember the mall walkers? You know, they would be able to mall walk every single day. You could turn the uh, downstairs mall area into uh, healthcare facilities like, um, you know, just everything, anything you think of oh, that would be open, you know, like uh, even, um, even a, a like dock of the box type places, anything like heart, diabetes, everything. You could have those all downstairs that all down like a medical mall. Right. And the upstairs could be just for um, residents. Right. So they could have their own like individual little apartments in each one of the stores. That's my dream. And you could even have a food court again. You could have the, I miss, I miss the mall food courts, the really good mall food courts where they had the really good soft pretzels and the, the good hot dogs and the good pizza and the Chinese food. And Oh, it was so good. There's like our mall now is like half of the stuff is closed down. They should turn that into something that's useful. I, I don't, I'm not opposed to it. I think it's a great idea. What do you think? I, they still have malls, don't they? Not really. Well, not, not, did you, did you not like, you, I don't, when we were young, the mall was like, you know, that's where you went, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, the mall was a it was an event. You went to the arcade. You went to the movies. You you walked around the mall. I mean, you it was the mall was. Do an you event. miss the mall, or do you miss the time where you were when the malls were around? Like you miss being being free and I miss and... being able to go to one specific place and get everything you could possibly need in one specific place. Yeah, I, I do. I do. I do have fond memories of like, especially. I'm sure the food wasn't that great, but um, man, it's just. It's it's I miss those days. I miss the time of that. Uh, what do you think about Elizabeth Perry that just said stop with the term boomer? It is extremely offensive. I am sixty one and no way relate to this group. My parents, they're baby boomers. That's what the I didn't make the name. It's been around since you've been born. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> that like I'm Gen X. The baby boomers was a thing like i don't know what to tell you gen alpha gen z like i don't know how to stop it you're gonna have to contact every newspaper every publication that's been been uh, alive since before you were born that's been around i don't yeah, know they're called the baby you. boomers because that's the they came home from the war right and had kids and, yeah they had tons of kids everybody was yeah. having babies yeah there was a boom of babies and you know if you've been at war for all that time, you know, of course that's what's going to happen. <laughs> People miss their husbands. They miss their husbands. You know, they do some closeness. All right. This kid, this kid, this kid right here says, hi, Christina and Eddie. How many acres are in Montana? Man, that's a lot of acres in private ownership. There is a 94 billion. Is that correct? Is that where the exclamation point? A million, 94 million acres, 94 million acres. It makes up 3.8% of the U.S. That state uses 62% of its land for agricultural purposes. There's 27,000 farms and ranches on, in Montana. And the crops value over $2 million. How about that? There's some 
There's some facts for you. Thanks, Eddie. Fascinating. Here, I got a question for you. Insurance companies not willing to direct uh, deal directly with borrowers usually pay a loan servicing and preparation fee and make real estate mortgage loans to purchase indirectly through either Freddie Mac, Saving and Loans Associations, mortgage companies, or FHA or the VA. What's the correct answer? I don't know. You said it so fast. I mean, the process. Insurance companies not yeah. willing to deal directly with borrowers usually pay a loan servicing or preparation fee okay. and make real estate mortgage loans to purchase indirectly through Freddie Mac, Savings and Loan Associations, mortgage companies, or FHA or the VA. Savings and loan? No, mortgage companies. Huh. Good try. I'm just seeing if you actually got a real estate uh, license or I'm testing you. Here's another no. one. Ready? <laughs> I'm not doing this. Kevin Rivera here says, question. Come on. They don't care. The audience doesn't care about your I question. I know. No one, no, one uses, no one uses that information. Yeah. Kevin Rivera says, question. What do you guys think of the federal bill that forces hedge funds uh, with single family houses to sell them uh, at a 10 year term? Okay. Here's the thing. No way that goes through. Oh, that's exactly what I was going to say. That is a bunch of smoke and mirrors. Like I need to be elected and I need my people and constituents to think I'm doing something on Capitol Hill. So I'm going to create this bill because I know my constituents care about this. And it's going to get me a lot of press in the papers for free. Knowing good and darn well, most likely that those will bills are, yeah, because you know, it's not a lot. The bill has to hit the floor first. And there's a there is a hierarchy of what bills actually ever hit the floor. It will never, in my opinion, hit the floor because all of them suckers, every single one of those suckers on that floor are bought and paid for, for by corporations. And they know where their bread is buttered. And if they wanted to be elected again, that will never, ever hit the floor. And if it does, you can see how many people that just walk right out and just are absent for that specific vote or or they, they just vote against it and come up with all sorts of reasons why corporations are really not the enemy and that it's really our fault that, that we let this happen. They'll blame it on us and they won't vote for it because it is, they'll say it's not going to help. It's not going to help the issue. You know, they'll frame it in a different way. <laughs> That's how it works. Yeah, it's a bunch of hoes. It's a it's a paper and words that make the public feel good, but it's never going to amount to anything. That's what I think. Do you concur? Javier, man, a few yes. words. Yes. <laughs> man, man, a few words. <laughs> There's nothing else to say. It's just like, and it's funny how that bill's being brought up right now, right before election. So we're going to build all this, all this um, tension and uh, build all suspension and nothing's going to happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, don't even let it affect you. Yeah. David has a question. He says, uh, question forward slash dream for uh, a for profit mom and pop investors and more that would be com, um, compete with black rocks of the world, making a modest uh, percentage buying fixers and silver tsunami finance infills and rent. I don't know what you, uh, I don't know what your question is. I don't really understand your question, but Maybe there's I, a second. I, yeah. Buying fixers and silver tsunami finance infills in rent. Well, I know like they've been talking about the silver tsunami forever. Um, I mean, honest to God, this has been going on since 2000 and I was probably 18 that I started reading about the silver tsunami that was supposedly going to be a big transfer of wealth that was going to go up and down from uh, the baby boomers. I'm sorry. That's what they're called. <laughs> the baby boomers over to the Gen X. Um, community. And uh, what they're finding out now is that uh, th like baby boomers love to buy real estate. They bought the most real estate uh, during, during the uh, last uh, housing boom. They bought second houses. And, but the other thing they're concerned about is that because the cost of living, the people that don't have like a ton of money, uh, they're, they're using their homes as their ATM to in order to afford healthcare. So by the time that the wealth would have transferred to younger generations, there's nothing left because they had to pay to survive. Their retirement pensions and 401ks dried up and they have nothing left except for the equity in their home. And so by the time that it would have gone to members of you know younger generations, it's gone. There's no more wealth to transfer to. 
it goes to back to corporations. So I don't think that um, the wave of homes, smaller homes, like that's what the, originally they said the silver tsunami was going to have a bunch of um, people that have moved from like up north. There's going to be all these smaller homes available to the younger generations. You're just going to have to wait it out because there's going to be this big mass of houses that hit the market. And that that didn't happen. They bought more houses. They, they kept that house and they bought another one. Debbie Brady says, rumor has that Christina is going to start her own cooking channel. <laughs> I am not. I am not. <laughs> I, I've been getting into bread. I've been making sourdough bread. And I post. She's making that bread. I am. No, like sourdough bread. <laughs> sourdough bread. Not that bread. <laughs> uh, we got a question. It says, can multi-generational living help address our needs into getting into housing? Singapore's issues are proximity grants to people who buy homes near their family. I, I've said this before. It's definitely a possibility that like, because there isn't anything smaller, there's always something bigger, right? So if you could tolerate living with your family and have multi-generational homes. That isn't a bad idea. What do you say, Javier? Of course, hundred percent. They just need to make it easier for, uh, I feel like, isn't the loans, aren't they super complicated? <laughs> like they, they need to make it way easier. But you got it like, but you can work with the right people, right? You just have to work with the right lender that understands who's purchasing, right? Uh, Cause yeah, I've, we've done it here. I've seen it here where like there's three generations of people purchasing the house. They're all on the loan um, where they're pooling together all that income. Um, but I had to find the right kind of lender to do it. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't just your average bank of America coming in and doing those type of loans. No, it was uh, another type of lender that was local to the area that could uh, help out. Uh, buyers that were doing that. I think it's a genius idea, um, especially as, as generations get older. Cause I don't know if you guys have seen like to a healthcare facility for somebody like needing assisted living, the cheapest I've seen in the United States, this is just for one month is $8,000. Most people don't have $8,000 a month to spend on home health care. But if you had a house full of people of all generations, you know, everybody could pitch in and help to take care of somebody in their, their last days. And, and, um, I don't know. I think it's a pretty good idea. hundred you know? percent. Somebody, Crow Homestead said PG tips is the basic English tea. It may be the basic English tea, but it's delicious. And I like the strong flavor. <laughs> so, it's delicious to me. Basic may be basic, but I love it. <laughs> It's probably like the Folgers of coffee, you know, like in the tea world, but it's delicious. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I need to, I like like an iced tea and I, I can't, I've never gotten into like the hot teas, but I'm give me a cane sugar tea. Oh my God. I'm trying to eat less sugar. My mom's diabetic and uh, she's like in the hospital this last week. So it was really oh, tough and open my open doors. I opened my eyes to like, Oh my gosh, like if she has it, then if I keep my lifestyle, I'm definitely going to get it. So, I'm in day two of low sugar, low salt, and I miss. I wish I can take a bath in cane sweet tea or Coke or Pepsi or Dr. Pepper. I, I wish I can just be naked in a nice old ice bath of it and just drink it and drink my own filth. Sorry, I'm really struggling right now. You need to watch, you need to watch the movie Saltburn. <laughs> what movie? Saltburn. After salt. we get done here, you're gonna watch this. Saltburn. Yeah, go. I watch don't watch those kind of dirty movies anymore. No, well, just look at the bath and tub scene. Speaking okay. of filth in the bathtub. Anyways, Gone Rogue says I'm looking to relocate into Colorado Springs area. It seems to, like apartments are completely overpriced, almost everywhere. Well, Colorado's been known to be very expensive. I'm not like there's. And it has ups and downs. I have a friend that lives, oh my God, what part of uh, Colorado does she live? They've had price reductions, but I can't think of the area. Oh Lord, have mercy. I'm going to, I'm looking her up on the phone. Um, but Colorado has always been expensive. And you know, when it really got expensive is when they made pot legal. I mean, then it really went rogue expensive, but if you get like further out of the city areas, you get better deals. You get better deals. Yeah, I know. Oh, what's your opinion on pot? What's my what? What's your opinion on pot? I, I have no, I really have no opinion. I don't care. I mean, do what you want to do. 
If you want to drink alcohol, drink alcohol. It has nothing to do with the homes. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do that in your home, have at it. You know, I don't care. Well I don't said. think hurt anybody. Uh, M. Dizzy Lizzie says, I'm a boomer and proud of it. Fantastic. I'm nearly there. I mean, like, I'm like, I think I'm only like a couple years away from being a boomer, I think. I think. I don't know. What's, you don't, what's you don't become a boomer. It's based on where you were born. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm just like, I think I'm just, a, I think I'm just shy of being, maybe I'm not. My, I found out my parents are not boomers, by the way. They're, they are uh silent generation. They are silent generation. I was or wrong. The, are they that. the forgotten or are they, are they silent? I think they're silent. Oh. I think they're the silent generation. That's what they, hmm. I thought that's what they were called. They knew when to keep their mouth shut. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I don't know. I just made that up. D Jack says I need Christina's music playlist. She's being rocking. Oh, it's the voices in my head. They be singing to me all day long. Um, Christina has a little little touch of the crazies. That's all right though. <laughs> Crow Crow says it. Um, quite late here. Catch you next week. Take care, everyone. I appreciate you coming in. Any week you can come in here. I know it's super late there. I've got some friends in Liverpool and I'm always shocked when they like, they'll message me at like six o'clock at night. I'm like, what are you doing awake? <laughs> hey, Bob, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. If you have any questions about um, real estate, please put them in the chat. I see some coming in. Eddie will put them up on the screen. Muddy Sneaker says, um, am I correct in assuming by the charts, not only the new builds in Texas are the only affordable option anymore. Yeah, that's very possible. That's very possible because, you know, the builders are giving incentives uh, right now. Um, they they're the ones that are giving like uh, the, they've been buying down rates. They've been giving um, they've been given like uh, packages for closing costs. They uh, upgrade packages that, you know, they're real. They're willing to uh, negotiate. And in some cases, so I'm not, I don't feel bad for them. Because when the market was like hot to trot and they were low on having as many houses they needed, they raked home buyers over the coals. People would be under contract and they'd say, I'm sorry, in order for you to purchase this, it's gone up a hundred thousand dollars more. So, you know, unless you're qualified for that, we're going to go ahead and sell it to the next guy. And they, they felt no remorse. So the fact that home builders might have to take a little deduction in their houses in order for them to get sold. Some of them deserve it. Some of them deserve it. Hang in there. Sugar cravings are brutal. I, I hear that's what they're, they're telling you to hang in there. Do you know that uh, this is the craziest thing? I actually have to consume more salt than the normal person because I can't process potassium correctly. Is that why so, you're so salty? Yes. Yes, exactly. But it, it got really bad. I used to do hair. And it got really bad when I was doing hair all the time. So like somebody at work was a smarty pants and put like a hamster salt lick on the mirror. <laughs> They're like, this Christina starts getting cramps again. We're going to just never lick this. <laughs> anyway. You know, when you, we know when you're doing hair, you shouldn't be huffing the smells, you know, that, right? Yeah. I, I, that was years ago. <laughs> uh, you know that like at that time they, they allowed us to have formaldehyde to sanitize our equipment. Oh my gosh. I had that in my drawers, formaldehyde tablets. So who knows what's wrong with me? It's formaldehyde, probably. Uh, Susan says, I'd like to know a little more about getting a mortgage. She wants to know a little bit more about getting a mortgage. Well, I would tell you to uh, meet with a local lender in your area. Not just one, though. Meet with several. And I would tell you to interview them. Because although they're letting you borrow their money, you want to enjoy the experience and feel like you're being taken care of. And you want to compare those numbers and make sure you're getting the best deal possible. Because some of the nicest people in the world, when you're talking to them, will give you the sh poopiest deals ever. <laughs> I just stop myself. I almost said a potty word on air. They'll give you some really crappy deals. So just, uh, you know, compare those numbers. I'd say, you know, don't, don't make yourself crazy. Um, go ahead and uh, meet with three different lenders and see what, what they have available to you. What do you, what is your advice, Javier? So you have to understand how the business works. The mortgage professionals you're going to talk to are salespeople who got a license to, to know what to say and not to say, to not get themselves in trouble. 
So if you're going to go talk to multiple low mortgage officers, know that you're talking to salespeople. So you want to, before you go talk to someone about a mortgage, make sure they're not there to, they're not financial advisors. So I, I urge you to make sure you have your personal finances in order first, make sure to research how to work a budget, how, what you can afford. And honestly, I would even invest time and money into even going to see in the financial advisor first to make sure all your ducks are, are in a row. Um, so if, once you've done all that, then you just know that you're 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 stepping into a, it's a gladiator you know you're stepping into the pit you want to make sure when you do talk to them you understand that they work for you you don't work they don't you don't work for them so you need to basically as you interview them like you're not interviewing they're interviewing you for the job right so mm -hmm. don't come in there expecting to be educated and taught how things work their salespeople go in there you already have an idea of how things work and have them print out the 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 sheet of what their costs are you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people like to shop interest rates up front. I say it's good to get a general idea, but it's kind of pointless to do it up front because they can't lock in the rate until it's under contract and the rate changes every day. So right. what good does it do you to get the interest rate, best interest rate initially when a month from now when you're under contract and be completely different? So shop around a few things, shop around what the cost of the loan is going to be, shop around what in, what incentives are they giving to make sure to get your business because every everyone has different products. Even though everyone is using the same loan, they have different products. And more importantly, shop around how available they are. Like, are they going to answer the phone on the weekend? Are they going to be available? Are they going to pass you off once you're under contract? So really uh, go into it, stepping into like your, they're interviewing for the job with you and have these questions ready and prepared. Nothing makes me angrier than like uh, somebody that has a lender, you know, like you got, you, you didn't choose the lender for them. They, they have picked their lender. So you're having a conversation with that lender. And then sure enough, once they're under contract and you've sent them over the contract, you never hear from that person ever again. From there on out, it's some other random person. And then you're dealing with four other people by the time that it has closed. And you never heard from that original person again. Like I get so annoyed. I'm like, oh, well, I guess you did your job. You sold, you sold the mortgage, didn't you, buddy? <laughs> you know, like that bothers me. But I don't know how it is in, um, uh, in Arizona, but here in Louisiana, a lot of times the lenders actually show up to closing with the the with the buyers. Is that common? In, no. In there? Yeah, we I've have never that. seen that. Yeah, we, we they do it here. They do, and that, I always I thought that was great. I never had it happen in Florida, but here it's pretty common. I think it's all about the culture. I think you guys, your culture is a little more out, not outdated, sorry, bold fashion, which is great. I think everyone should be showing up at the closing table. I mean, I'll be honest. I don't show up to every one of mine either. It's just the way things uh -huh. are done in Phoenix is just the the title company and the, they just kind of take over and they handle things, you know? And then when I've gone, I've gone to the majority of them. When I do go to them, I'm literally just sitting there smiling, looking handsome because like they, they, there's not really much to do. It's not like your, a, you don't give them a, a gift. Oh, I mean, that's that's so once it's, it doesn't close at the at the signing table, it closes after. So you sign and then a day, like maybe that day or the next day, it'll, it'll officially record and then it's closed. And so, then you go deliver the keys and do all that. OK, so here in Louisiana, it, it like the minute everything's dry, like the minute it, it gets funded within a few yeah, minutes. Yeah, you guys, so you guys are a table funding state. Yeah, so uh, we table soon closing, as it's funded, sorry. it's done. It's closed. And no, so, that's not how it works here. Yeah. Yeah, see that that's what everybody has to understand. Real estate in every single state works completely different. I remember in Texas it's like that. Like you have to wait for it to be funded and yeah. everything to close. In Louisiana, you, have... you guys show up in your horses yeah. and then you guys have your own pen. We show we show up with our a sack of crawfish and then after we're done, <laughs> we cook it up. You, you cook it and then you exchange crawfish and the minute that you take a bite of that crawfish, it's now your house. Fun. And yeah, and the, and all the mortgage paperwork is done on napkins. <laughs> <laughs> Don't lose them now. <laughs> <laughs> Susan says, uh, I want to buy our neighbor's house so my kids can move in and we have more land for the family. I'd like to know more about getting a mortgage with my kids. Sorry, that last part of the question cut off. Okay. So um, again, the, the, the answer doesn't change. I say meet with a local lender, local lenders and see if it's going to be possible for them to put on the mortgage. I want you to also know this, that your survey for your property, even though it's going to be in everybody's name, will not change. Those property lines are exactly the same. And the only reason I'm telling you this is because 
I've had this happen too here in Louisiana. It's very common for, for family to subdivide pieces of property. And there's lots of people living on them on a, on a piece of land. And they think this is my house. This is my land. And then they find out that, that there was never a proper division of property. And that survey is not correct that what they got was just kind of basically on a napkin, wasn't, wasn't a true survey. And so, you know, just know that the land that is surveyed that you're purchasing with your family is just that it's not becomes one encompassed piece of land, even though everybody in the family owns it. I know that sounds crazy, but that's like, it's very common here in Louisiana. There's actually people's, you'll see the family's names as the street names. So you know, which family, which family lives down in that subdivision. I am not joking. It is a real wow. thing. I know. I know. <laughs> like you can see it. Like it'll be like uh, Jeb Vilar and then it will say Irwin Vilar. And then it says Donna Vilar. <laughs> and that whole side of the family lives down those roads. It's a real thing. <laughs> Do you have a small horn street over there? No, I'm not. I'm not that. I'm not uh, native. I to thought you're, you own a lot of property here. You keep saying that. I don't own anything. Oh, you probably missed it. I what I do have a, a rental property, and somebody ran a car through it. You missed that. That was a couple of weeks ago. I showed the pictures of and that. And then you 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 got your vengeance by um, buying their property from them, taking it under them, and then you bought their entire street, right? You are totally making a villain story out of me. What is wrong with you? You need you need sugar. you need you need <laughs> I need you sugar. Need sugar. <laughs> You're and like, I don't know. Can, Just go get diabetes. <laughs> you're you're much happier with sugar. You're much happier with sugar. <laughs> Annie Shenanigan says, my lender came uh, to closing. I was shocked. He took me out to lunch afterwards as well. See, there's some good lenders out there. You, the people in Phoenix are just salty. I mean, if you define a, 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 good ex, a good experience by showing up at closing, I mean, there's much more things you can do, you know? I, I just think it's like just nice. It's just nice that like literally people are this most of the time. This is the most expensive thing they've ever purchased in their life. And you tr they're trusting you to help them buy this most expensive thing. So why wouldn't you take a good 45 minutes out of your day, hour out of your day to spend with them because they trusted you enough to buy a house with you, you know, buying the most expensive thing. I think lenders should do it. I'm sorry. They, they they can't be that busy that they couldn't sit at a closing for people. I'm sorry. You know, yeah, that's why they have just... assistance and all the other stuff to do all that other stuff, you know? Yeah. How about real it's estate agents? Should, should they be there? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. I'm there. Okay. You're there. KJ says we're her two favorite real estate agents. You two Ooh. real estate agents. KJ. KJ said hi. She likes us both. I missed it. You missed it. Yep. Who's oh, I on, see it. Yeah. Who's on first says, should we assume everything uh, a mortgage lender says is a lie, <laughs> like a car salesman? Well, you know what? I'll tell you this. Data doesn't lie. So what they put on the paper is, I always say to people, see what they write down. You know, don't, don't. Not what this comes out of their mouth, what they actually write down on paper and then go to the next lender and ask for that same sort of paper so you can compare notes and you're going to have to do like a, a list, you know, and look for any kind of like fees that are not being explained. Look for anything that doesn't seem clear to you and um, and ask why. Why are they charging more for an interest rate? What What's the reason behind it? And sometimes like you're the interest rates what wraps you in, but there's some other thing that's like, you don't know about that's going to cost you more. So just, you know, do a little comparisons, you know, Lamar says, Christina funding seems to happen the first business day after signing. Yeah. Well, I mean, like honest to God, we, whatever we sign here in Louisiana, we just sit there. We literally sit there and we're just waiting. Sometimes it's like as, as quick as 10 minutes. Sometimes it's like 30 minutes. And we just sit in the room until it's funded. And then once it's funded, it's done. And we all meet in the lobby. We shake hands. They thank everybody. Make sure uh, keys are exchanged. Uh, any kind of like garage door openers. And everybody goes off to their cars. And that's it. You know, weird, weird. 
So anyways, if y'all are looking for a real estate agent, I am finally done with vacation. Monday starts my first real estate year of uh, 2024. I have been off for two weeks and now I'm back in the saddle. So uh, real estate content will be starting resuming on Wednesdays at uh was it 9:45? Yeah, 9:45 release. Not this coming up Wednesday, but next Wednesday because I have to film it, and <laughs> and I will be answering all my emails. So if you need to get a hold of me, you can go to my website, christinasmallhorn.com. Click on any of the pink buttons, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Just go ahead and fill out that form. Super simple. Super simple. Go straight to my email box, and I will get a hold of you. And if you're looking to listen to this as a podcast, I don't know why you would. But blah, 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 blah. There. Yeah. You, heard, you just heard me in a podcast. Blah, 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 yeah, blah, 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 blah. Here you go. Here we are. <laughs> podcast. Um, blah, 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 right there. <laughs> Just hear me. Just hear me go. Blah, 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 blah. And you know, if you want to hear uh, Javier go blah, 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 on his channel, just go over to his channel with the minus I took, I took a two week. I took a two week break too. My poor yeah. editors. I just, my poor editor. I mean, they're getting paid still, but they just been like, I just ah, it's just so terrible. Anyways, yeah, I need. I need to get back on it. I'm back again on Monday as well. Yeah, I'm just, I got to film. I got to film it. I film it tomorrow. I already know what I'm doing. If you guys really want to know, it's going to be the uh, modular home companies to look at in 2024. I found some really good ones um, that I, I think are going to actually, they're not full of garbage. I don't like, there's been some modular home companies. I'm not saying any names, but you guys can fill in the blanks. Uh, that say they're going to help solve the affordability crisis. And they've, uh, gotten a lot of investment money to make that happen. And here we are, I don't know, five years later, waiting for those same homes that people have been waiting on a, on a wait list now for all this time and still don't have them in their backyards. Makes me a little mysterious. Makes me a little, little fishy. A little, little something smells not right, but whatever. I didn't say who. You just fill in the blanks, but this is the list I'm coming out with. Doesn't have those people on there. This is, these are actual people, actual houses that people already have in their yards. So I'm very excited about that. Very excited about that. All right, everybody. Thank you, moderators. Uh, thank you so much. It's 2024. I appreciate you guys even coming out here again and helping to keep the chat clean. I always appreciate every single one of you. Uh, thank you so much to our super chatters. We didn't have any super chatters today, but uh, thank you to you guys that do super chat. I always appreciate you. And Javier, look into my eyes, Javier. I appreciate you too. <laughs> I have to go like this if I look in your eyes. Uh, I'm looking right at you. I'll look at the lens. Yes. I appreciate you. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> Time to dance. Right, everybody. This is so long. Farewell. What's up, what's up with this old timey music? It's, it's like, it's, it's, you know, New Year's. It's the music you play in Louisiana at closings. Oh, party Gras time. That's fine. Uh, Gotta get Party Gras. Party Gras. Party Gras. Gotta come down for break. It'll be fun. Enjoy it. Actually, yeah, I think I might. I can't, I'm a married man though. I can't see boobies. Wait, that's only in the French court. It's not in real boobies. Again. That's only in the forest with that garbage. We're still alive, by the way. I know. I know. It's all right. <laughs>